Without Hi, well, I'm really delighted to be able to join um, uh, uh, you, um, even if virtually. This really seems like it's been a terrific uh, uh, series of talks. And um, I'm talking about the sort of uh, general subject of uh, the UVIR connection and effective field theory. Um, and uh, 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 many of the things uh, that I'm talking about um, are, are contained in sort of two papers that came out in uh, uh, December. Uh, one with the Yu Tin and Jimmy Huang uh, on the, the so-called EF dehedron, um, and, uh, and another one with Monica Pate, uh, Anna Maria Bartlario, and Andy Strominger on, um, on uh, celestial amplitudes and its connection uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the UV. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on the aspect that has to do with the connection uh, to the UV. And um, I should, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll preface uh, all my remarks um, by, by saying that, uh, you know, since, uh, since my earliest days as a graduate student, I've been a red-blooded effective field theorist, like almost everyone who uh, came up in the field uh, thinking about physics beyond the standard model, that was the, uh, the, the, the picture of effective field theory, um, both the sort of, uh, uh, the, the kind of, roughly speaking, the, the Harvard picture uh, uh, associated with Steve Weinberg and, and uh, that I learned mostly from uh, Howard Georgi, um, and the Wilsonian picture, uh, these completely transformed my understanding of what fundamental physics is really about. Um, and so I was an absolutely hardcore sort of Wilsonian effective field theorist uh, uh, for much of the uh, early part of my career. Um, uh, but uh, starting around 15 years ago, um, uh, I've been uh, thinking more and more about things that uh, are uh, somehow in tension with the, uh, with the Wilsonian paradigm. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, of course, everything in tension with the Wilsonian paradigm, one way or another, has to do with this, uh, with this uh, UVIR connection. So what I want to do in the talk today is say a few sort of general things about this UVIR connection and talk about um, uh, what I see as uh, a number of interesting frontiers in, in exploring it. Um, uh, so I'll talk about sort of the three sort of connected, but uh, broadly connected frontiers in exploring the, the, uh, uh, the connection between the sort of UVIR uh, uh, entanglement uh, and how we think about effective field theory. But let's just uh, uh, begin uh, with the sort of glory of this Wilsonian paradigm um, is the absolute decoupling of UV and IR physics. And, you know, uh, the slogan here is that you need a microscope to probe short distances. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what's going on uh, uh, with physics uh, on, a, on a scale with separation between two points, um, well, when that separation between the points from the distance, when x minus y squared is tiny, uh, you need very high energy. You need a microscope to probe short distances. And, uh, and the standard picture of effective field theory uh, sharpens this and turns this into a powerful engine for uh, both thinking about physics conceptually as well as doing calculations. Um, but I want to stress two aspects of this. Uh, first, this picture is fundamentally Euclidean. Um, uh, and everything that we're talking about here, this notion of short distance is a short Euclidean distance. And secondly, the kind of, uh, the, uh, at least some of the origins of this picture from Wilson's thinking um, came out, uh, came from uh, condensed matter systems. And, uh, and both of these things are in tension with the real world. Um, uh, a slogan that I like that I've said many times is the world is not a crappy metal. Uh, and there are a number of aspects in which it isn't a crappy metal. Uh, first, um, and, and most basically, uh, the physics is Lorentzian and not Euclidean. And even in field theory, uh, even in field theory, where in principle, of course, we can get the Lorentzian answer from analytic continuation from Euclidean space, We've seen over the past 15, 20 years, of course, going back further to uh, uh, dispersion theory, but sort of uh, picking up again uh, around 15, 20 years ago, uh, that the Lorentzian aspects of the physics um, uh, highlight things that are much more obscure and difficult to see from the uh, Euclidean point of view. For example, uh, 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 in Lorentzian signature, you can have two points that are close to each other, quote unquote, close to each other, where x minus y squared is close to zero. But that close distance with x minus y squared uh, close, uh, uh, approaching zero can actually be probed at macroscopic scales 
as long as they're close to the light cone. So um, uh, one place where this uh, shows up is in uh, the bounds on the coefficient of higher dimension operators that we can have in, in effective field theory. Again, in the standard picture of effective field theory, the only way you can probe uh, or the, the most effective way of probing higher dimension operators is if they break some symmetry of the low energy theory. And if you had a situation with like just a, a, a scalar field with a shift symmetry um, and uh, a leading interaction, uh, like uh, some constant e5 to the fourth, then that doesn't break any symmetry. That's like a garden variety higher dimension operator. So you think there's nothing much you can say about it. And, and that would be at least naively true in the Euclidean picture. But, uh, but we know that that's not the case when we think about the actual Lorentzian physics. And the reason is that uh, there is something which is critical about the two derivative theory. And the, what's critical about the two derivative theory is that uh, signals um, propagate exactly at the speed of light. And so, uh, so the, the, the two-point function is exactly supported on the light cone. And therefore, if you turn on some homogeneous background, for example, a background where phi dot is not equal to zero, then it's possible that, uh, that you can have corrections to that that can either push you inside or outside of the light cone. And you can be sensitive to it from a macroscopic experiment that you can sort of measure a time advance or delay at humongous distances and yet be sensitive to the coefficient of a higher dimension operator. And the best way to be learn, for example, the coefficient of these higher dimension operators have to be positive in order to avoid superluminality. Um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, we can also see that that positivity uh, arises from uh, dispersive arguments, which I'll review in a moment uh, quickly and talk about uh, extensions. But that's the, the, the first crucial thing is that the physics is Lorentzian. And so the sort of decoupling between short and long distance that's sort of trivial in Euclidean space is more subtle in uh, Lorentzian signature. Secondly, the world is gravitational. And this is a much deeper sense in which, and a very famous sense in which there's a UVIR uh, correspondence. And uh, there are many aspects of this, but one of the simplest and most famous ones to talk about is what happens when we collide particles at energies much bigger than M Planck. In a garden variety, non-renormalizable theory, like let's say the weak interactions, um, before we knew about Ws and Zs, if we just imagined uh, um, what could happen when we scattered electrons and neutrinos against each other at energies a thousand times above the Fermi scale, we'd have no idea what happens. Uh, we really need the sort of UV completion in order to be able to even roughly say what would happen if we did those collisions. But that's not true when we have gravity. And that's because that energy is much, much bigger than the Planck scale. We actually produce a large black hole. And we roughly know what happens. That large black hole evaporates by Hawking evaporation. So this is kind of an amazing thing that the hardest to understand UV theory, uh, gravity, uh, actually at zeroth order, we know what happens. You just produce big black holes and they emit soft uh, radiation and uh, evaporate. And so, um, so we know something about ultra high energy states and the ultra high energy states actually become larger and larger. Um, uh, the rays in these black holes become larger and larger. And then there are consistencies uh, about what very large black holes have to look like. There's the consistency of the laws of horizon thermodynamics for black holes, for example, uh, which then enforce uh, infrared, uh, 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 which enforce uh, consistent conditions that we can understand in the IR. Uh, now, um, this has been understood for a long time, of course, but uh, I think um, probably most people thought that, the, that the, uh, the, the novel consistency conditions associated with the fact that we know ultramassive states are big black holes would only be of sort of used for very esoteric questions. For example, um, there are holographic bounds, which tell you the number of degrees of freedom grow like uh, the area in Planck units rather than the volume. But, but, but the questions about this and the questions about uh, black holes and the information paradox and so on naively involve uh, uh, effects that go like e to the minus some entropy. So e to the minus one over d Newton. Um, and naively, I think most people thought that, uh, that uh, whatever these uh, roughly holographic or UVIR aspects of uh, gravity were, they're only relevant for these very, very precise questions or these non-perturbatively uh, small effects. And I think over the past uh, uh, 15 years or so, there's more and more evidence that that's not necessarily true. And there are actually things that we care about which are impacted by these, uh, by these uh, considerations. For example, another famous old uh, 
consequence of this uh, of this type of thinking is the fact that there are no global symmetries in uh, quantum gravity. But the idea there's no global symmetries gets sharpened in the weak gravity conjecture to a statement that does not involve exponentially small effects, a statement that says that you can't make uh, sort of a, a U1 gauge coupling arbitrarily weak, uh, U1 gauge, gauge coupling G arbitrarily weak without bringing some kind of ultraviolet cutoff of the theory uh, uh, down as you hold M Planck fixed and that UV cutoff scale would scale like G times M Planck. So that's something that actually has teeth. Um, uh, and so those things aren't, aren't proven, they're still conjectures, but there's sort of more and more, and more evidence that, 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 that things like that are actually true. Uh, so that's another aspect of the, of the a deeper aspect of the UVIR connection is something uh, uh, gravitational. Uh, so, uh, the, the, so just, just to stress, the, the uh, A is not in conflict with the, uh, uh, you know, what's only an effective field theory. I mean, it, it's a fact even just about field theory. It, it, but A is just saying that there's more in the Lorentzian world of field theory that meets the Euclidean eye. And that it's, uh, and it's, very, it's, it's very useful to, 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 to think in this uh, Lorentzian way. B is something that just says that the whole picture of UVIR decoupling is wrong when you have gravity ultimately. Very, very high energies uh, turns into long distances again. And of course, uh, uh, we, we, just to mention quickly, um, uh, C, uh, that, that there's a, another indication, not at, just at the Planck scale, but perhaps at uh, much longer distances, that there's something wrong with the sort of this basic Wilsonian picture of the world, which is the, the spectacular failure <laughs> Of the Wilsonian notion of naturalness, which works beautifully in kinetic matter physics, of course, that's where it came from. But the failure for the cosmological constant and the uh, and the Higgs mass parameter, of course, it fails dramatically for the cosmological constant. We don't know for sure if it's failed entirely for the Higgs mass squared yet. But as I like to say, if you turn into a pumpkin at midnight, uh, given the LHC results, it's around 11:45 p.m. for this notion of uh, uh, naturalness for the weak scale. Okay, so these are various reasons. Um, uh, uh, th these are, uh, 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 and, and of course, uh, C also suggests, uh, at least a failure of naturalness, one thought that it suggests is that perhaps there's an explanation, uh, uh, an unnatural explanation for these parameters that involves some kind of uh, correlation between the UV and the IR, although that, that's, that's very vague and I won't say more about it here, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, I just wanted to give this quick mention to another indication that, that there's some, something wrong with, the, uh, with these Wilsonian ideas, not just at the Planck scale, but uh, perhaps uh, closer to home. Uh, another comment um, is that uh, at least uh, the, the A and B, the, uh, the, the Lorentzian uh, nature of physics and, uh, and the fact that, uh, uh, that we have gravity, uh, those aspects of UVIR are clearly related to each other. For example, uh, the, uh, having causality or the absence of superluminal propagation uh, is crucially related to the uh, consistency of horizon thermodynamics. Um, it's an absolutely critical uh, part of, uh, uh, of uh, being able to talk about the uh, entropy assigned to horizons, that the notion of a horizon is universal. Um, so everyone has the same speed of light. And, uh, and even if we turn on interesting backgrounds, in those backgrounds, we shouldn't be able to have different species uh, propagate uh, with the different speeds. If we could, it wouldn't be clear which area, uh, uh, we, we could have different uh, horizons for different species and it wouldn't be clear which one of them to assign the entropy to. So uh, protecting the light cone, uh, which A is all about, is crucially related to the consistency of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, horizon thermodynamics and the issues in B. And you actually, we actually see this in many places. Uh, um, uh, I, I won't uh, spend too long talking about this, but this is one context where, where I'm uh, especially fond of uh, thinking about it. Again, going back to the weak gravity conjecture. Um, one way of talking about the weak gravity conjecture is the following. You imagine looking at the spectrum of elementary particles and of, 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 of objects in nature, particles in nature with some charge. As the mass gets larger and the charge gets larger. And, uh, and the claim is that uh, asymptotically, we have enormous, very massive objects uh, with huge charge, but with the mass to charge ratio equal to one in Planck units. And those are extremal black holes. And if you just imagine plotting what the spectrum looks like, 
so those guys have been mapped way bigger than M Planck. If we look at the, if we look at lighter objects in the real world, we have things like electrons whose mass is much smaller than M Planck and whose mass to charge ratio is minuscule, much much smaller than one. And the weak gravity conjecture, uh, a, a sort of strong form of the weak gravity conjecture, uh, would actually say that if we look at this plot of the, 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 the uh, spectrum of uh, particles of mass m um, on the horizontal axis and plot the mass to charge ratio on the vertical axis, then it asymptotes to one. That's what extreme low black holes are. But that, it should, but that this curve should uh, be approached from below. So that corrections should push you down, should push the mass to charge ratio down. Um, uh, that's again, that's one aspect of this uh, weak gravity conjecture that allows extreme low black holes to decay the lighter objects. Uh, and it's uh, associated with gravity being the weakest force. I mean, these are all uh, uh, equivalent statements. Um, but it's interesting to see how we can see uh, this pushing down of, of the curve. Uh, at, Asymptotically enormous masses, uh, there are corrections to the effective action, uh, to the two derivative effective action that are calculable corrections uh, coming from IR logarithms. Okay, so just the logarithmically enhanced graviton loops, they give us various higher dimension operators and four dimensions, they give us the F to the four operator. And uh, that's calculable, that gives you a calculable correction from super infrared uh, physics to the mass to charge ratio. And you can show that that correction always pushes you down. The sign of that correction is that indeed it always pushes you down. On the other hand, when you're closer to the Planck scale, uh, there are effects that come from integrating out massive string modes or whatever is going on in the UV. And uh, part of the evidence for the weak gravity conjecture is that in every situation where we've seen what those higher dimension operators are, we always find that, uh, that the signs work out in such a way that the mass to charge ratio gets pushed down. Um, so uh, down here, uh, around Dan Planck, around uh, and the string, uh, this has to do with what looks like details of, uh, of uh, the UV completion of gravity. Um, up here at enormous masses, it's something totally calculable from the effective field theory at long distances. And we see they're continuously connected to each other. So that, that there's, there's a basic fact that this curve is pushed down, but you ascribe this fact to something which is calculable effective field theory generating operators of the correct sign so that you can't get superluminality um, at asymptotically enormous masses. And you ascribe them instead to these uh, perhaps stringy higher dimension operators that come from consistent UV completions of gravity um, at, uh, uh, at masses uh, in the neighborhood of M Planck, but they're continuously connected to uh, each other. Okay, so, so I think um, uh, there is no, uh, to, in my mind, there is no very sharp distinction between the issues A and B, uh, and, they're, and they're continuously connected to each other. Actually, part of the reason they're continuously connected to each other is precisely the UVIR correspondence that tells us that these enormous masses, we are talking again about long distances where we can calculate many things by effective field theory. All right, so that's a, that's a rough a summary of, um, uh, of, uh, of some of the uh, sort of standard famous UVIR uh, connections. What I wanna talk about um, in the rest of the talk are uh, three frontiers in the UVIR EFT uh, connection. Uh, first, uh, is a, an extension of this sort of uh, basic idea that we alluded to uh, a moment ago, that there are positivity constraints on the coefficients of higher dimension operators in effective field theory coming from causality, um, uh, unitarity, causality, dispersion relations, and so on. Okay? So um, now uh, this is a subject that uh, uh, I think over the past uh, few years, there's been more and more papers about. I think I've seen that there's been a number of uh, uh, talks just in this series uh, on this general kind of theme. So uh, I won't go through this part in, uh, in, in great detail. Um, what I want is what I'll do instead, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll give the sort of basic framework. Um, I'll review the sort of basic framework where these things come from. What I want to stress instead is the geometric aspect um, uh, to this problem. Uh, that, that there's a, there are two origins of positivity um, that we standardly talk about, the, the positivity of energies and the positivity of probability. Uh, and these two positivities and causality um, uh, force the coefficients 
of uh, higher dimension operators in effective field theory to actually lie inside a certain geometric region. And I, I want to stress the geometric aspect of this problem. This geometric region um, we call the uh, uh, EF dehedron. Um, and I'll, so I'll, I'll tell you just something about the, the basic non-trivial facts that give you this geometry and just splash some of the results. But I, I, I suspect that, that these things are, are uh, probably more familiar uh, uh, to the audience um, of this lecture series. Uh, uh, next, I'll talk about um, another aspect of the uh, IRUV connection um, that, uh, that, 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 that that theories with interesting infrared physics um, are precisely the ones that are difficult to UV complete in a simple, straightforward way. Uh, and, uh, and if we ask this question about UV completion just at tree level, it very naturally leads us to thinking about strings. Um, and uh, so, so this is a second interesting aspect of the IR uh, UV connection. Um, and, uh, and here I'll, 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 I'll set up a question to see whether we can sort of discover uh, strings from the bottom up as the unique answer to the question of what could tree level UV complete gravity. Um, uh, it's a very well posed question and I'll give some uh, first uh, explorations in, in, this, in this direction. Um, the problem is, uh, as we'll see, that the problem is, 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 is beautifully posed, but is, uh, uh, but is a bit more non-trivial than you might think at first. But I still think it, uh, uh, that this is an area where probably a lot could be done. Um, also in part one, I'll, I'll sort of uh, sketch what we know about the uh, EF dehedra, but I also want to stress what some of the important physical uh, uh, ideas are that we still need to incorporate to, to do even better than, than, than we're doing in part one. And finally, in part three, um, uh, I'll, I'll switch to a talking about the, what looks like a different subject, but actually comes from uh, uh, very similar motivations. Um, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the so-called celestial scattering amplitudes. So um, these are scattering amplitudes that, that, are, uh, that are most natural if you think about a theory living on the uh, celestial sphere that surrounds any point in uh, Minkowski space. Um, and uh, and the, the physical point is that uh, uh, celestial scattering amplitudes are not scattering uh, amplitudes in, the, in momentum eigenstates like we normally think about, but are actually, it's natural to think about scattering boost eigenstates. Uh, and uh, scattering boost eigenstates completely destroys the uh, Wilsonian paradigm. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, I think this is extremely interesting because uh, uh, I'll give you some examples of that and I'll, I'll also some intuition about what's, what, uh, what celestial amplitudes look like and how we can translate things we know about effective field theory um, uh, into properties of uh, uh, celestial amplitudes. But the sort of zero order point is that when you think about scattering boost eigenstates, you can't even go to a low energy limit. There is no such thing as a low energy limit because you're scattering things of arbitrarily high energies. And, uh, and if we want to figure out how to go beyond the Wilsonian paradigm more sharply, uh, it's a, it seems like a good idea to begin with a situation where you don't have the comfort of being able to go there to begin with. Um, and that's what scattering boost eigenstates states does. And I'll spend uh, some time telling you again, some of the most basic things uh, about that. All right, so that's the plan. Uh, for the rest rest of the talk, and so um, let's get going. Okay, so first let's talk about the EF dehedra, um, and uh, and it's been long appreciated, uh, going back to the 60s, that locality and causality and unitarity imply um, uh, analyticity properties for scattering amplitudes. That's the uh, that's the it's really the hard part of the S matrix program was figuring out what does causality look like. Um, you know, it's not obvious if you just measure amplitudes far away at infinity, it's not obvious what property of the amplitude encodes the fact that it came from what you can ascribe to causal evolution in the interior of space time. And from, uh, from analogies from what we knew, know about sort of two point functions, propagators, what we learn about in Jackson um, uh, for index of refraction and so on, we know that it's somehow related to, to the uh, properties of the amplitude analytically continued in the complex plane. But what precisely that meant is still not, was still not perfectly understood by the S-matrix theorists in the 60s. We still don't exactly understand it today. I think this is an amazing, both embarrassment and opportunity that we don't know precisely what causality means 
at the level of the analytic properties of uh, uh, amplitudes. But we know roughly it means some kind of analyticity for amplitudes. And, uh, and uh, a unitarity means some kind of positivity of, of uh, probability. So it's been long understood uh, that, that, that at least the arrow in this direction has been uh, long, long understood. Now, over the past uh, 10 years or so, we've been seeing something like the opposite of the S matrix program, <laughs> um, which instead of trying to slavishly derive the rules of, uh, of uh, uh, it, it, it slavishly derive the amplitudes by imposing causality and unitarity um, on the result, um, which didn't work anyway, uh, in, in this approach, we, we take an opposite tack and we ask whether there's some kind of question that lives directly in the kinematic space that defines the amplitude, just in the space of n null momenta, for example, if I'm scattering n particles. Um, and, and we've been discovering that there, there are some fascinating geometric structures that live in this kinematic space. Uh, they, they're associated with the words amphitohedra, generalized isosahedra, cluster algebra, polytopes, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and these have an ab initio life of their own. They have a definition and life of their own. Um, and we learn to ask particular questions of these guys and the answers end up being interpreted as amplitudes that have locality and causality and unitarity. So it's not like locality, causality, unitarity, they're inputs but they're outputs from this, these more abstract, very simple, but more abstract structures that live in uh, kinematic space. From this point of view, the word positivity is incredibly important again. Uh, and various kinds of positivity and notions of so-called total positivity, um, which involve looking at matrices where all the determinants are positive, for example. That's a very common idea uh, that, that arises. Uh, that's the kind of star. And, uh, and these physical principles like locality, causality, unitarity are outputs from that. So we've been seeing that in more and more examples. And having seen that, um, we are motivated to go back to these old considerations uh, to see if there's any more positivity there. After all, in this, uh, in this second way of thinking, the positivity, some, uh, a different kind of positivity is, is more fundamental and it gives us uh, these other things which we normally associate with giving us positivity to begin with. So really motivated by the existence of these positive geometries, we went back to see whether there was somehow more positivity than met the eye in the, in the story of uh, factor field theory. And indeed there is, there's infinitely more hidden positivity. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, in a, in, a, in a sharp sense, all the coefficients of higher dimension operators in um, uh, uh, at least in the simple case of two to two scattering that we're, we're just about to talk about actually have to live inside uh, an analog of these geometries that we've been uh, seeing elsewhere um, uh, that, uh, that are associated with, with strikingly similar notions of positivity. Um, that, 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 that are these uh, EFT hedra. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, so I'm just gonna give you the sort of basic structure of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the argument. As I said, uh, there have been a number of talks on this type of thing in this series. So, uh, so I will really restrict myself to um, talking about uh, uh, the, the, what the origin of this, uh, of the, uh, of, of this geometry is. Um, but to begin with, we, we talk about the, uh, a basic process, AB to AB scattering. <clears throat> and imagine, uh, and, and uh, the first important point is that this has a dispersive representation. So <clears throat> uh, uh, just for simplicity to begin with, imagine that we're just integrating out massive particles. It could be at tree level, it could be at loop level, it could be strings. Okay, but we're just integrating out the massive particles and we're not looking at the massless loops in the low energy theory yet um, um, uh, in this uh, discussion. Then that means that in this approximation, uh, uh, the, the, the amplitude is analytic around the origin uh, and, and, and gets uh, cuts, uh, uh, massive cuts or poles far away. Now, um, the uh, crucial point is, is that uh, if we fix t uh, to be much smaller than m squared, then, uh, then it's, it's easy to argue, and you can argue this uh, both a little bit more abstractly and fancily by looking at Landau equations, or even very directly by looking at the Schwinger, param Schwinger Feynman parameterization of, uh, of general loop integrals, that, um, that uh, t doesn't have to be zero. You don't have to go directly to the forward limit. You can already just keep t much smaller than m squared. And all of the 
all the branch cuts here are, are associated with physical particle production. Okay? This is not true for general T. If T is big, then there are there are, there are you know, infamous things like anomalous thresholds and even worse things that can happen. Those are branch cuts whose discontinuities are not associated with physical particle production. Um, uh, so that's, that was another one of the big problems of, of the S-matrix program was the, how do we determine those? Okay. But we're not talking about that. We're just dealing with T uh, very small compared to, to an M squared. Um, uh, so first of all, the analytic structure of the S-plane is simple. And uh, secondly, you can argue that the amplitude is bounded basically by S squared. Um, now, in detail, it's a little bit different if you have a theory with a gap versus if you have a gravitational theory. I won't go through this in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, detail, um, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, the intuition is that since we're close to the forward limit, um, uh, we don't know what the, what the analytic properties of amplitudes are for totally general S and T, but close to the forward limit, it's close to a two-point function. And for two-point functions, we do know. For two-point functions, we know that uh, if I think about the two-point function in frequency space, causality in, in the time domain implies that the Fourier transform is analytic in the upper half plane in the Fourier domain. So we do know something about uh, the analyticity and boundedness of, uh, of, uh, uh, of amplitudes from causality and uh, unitarity for two-point functions. And that's inherited for a statement about uh, uh, the four-point function, again, as long as T is small enough. Okay, so the amplitude is bounded, um, and uh, and there's a somewhat different argument when when uh, when when you have massless graviton exchange and the amplitudes are dominated by by gravity. But interestingly, the final answer is the same. The amplitude is dumb is bounded by s squared, and that allows us to write using Cauchy's theorem a dispersion relation for for the amplitude. Again, t is fixed, and we think about it as a function of s. Okay, so here it is. Uh, the fact that it's bounded by s squared means there are these two. Subtraction terms, I won't, uh, uh, I won't talk about them anymore, but here's the interesting part. We have a sum or an integral over a spectrum, and then I just have a partial wave expansion. So it's a sum of, uh, with some weights of P S of M squared and some spins S. Um, the Legendre polynomial, or in, in general dimensions, are called Gegenbauer polynomial of cos theta that are now rewritten in terms of uh, S equals M squared and the propagators, okay? So, uh, and here I've written things in principle, we could have the S channel and the U channel, okay? So, uh, so uh, the bottom line is that, uh, is that uh, uh, fixing T, uh, causality, uh, fixing T, we have this simple analytic structure where all the branch cuts are controlled by, uh, by particle production um, and uh, causality, it tells us the amplitude is bounded by, by S squared as you go to infinity. That allows us to write this dispersive representation. And this dispersive representation has two important positive numbers in it. One is these probabilities are positive. PS of M squared is positive. Two, the spectrum is positive. The M squared are a positive. And so what we'd like to know is what is the implication of these two positivities on the expansion of A, S, and T uh, at low energies? Okay, so, um, so the effective field theory expansion is just, uh, is just expanding, um, uh, uh, expanding this expression at low energies uh, in this way. And we have these coefficients A, D, comma, Q. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so let me just organize all of them in a table, A0, zero, zero, A10, zero, A20, and so on. So uh, the first number is the kind of dimension of the, of the coupling. Uh, the second number Q is uh, the sort of expansion around the uh, uh, around the forward limit. Okay? So we have this infinite table of numbers that come um, uh, that, that we have this infinite table of uh, coefficients, uh, and the claim is that these infinite uh, uh, set of coefficients are actually forced to lie in an interesting geometry. Okay? Um, now this this sharpens uh, some some intuitive things that we expect, uh, perhaps just from naturalness on the coefficient of higher dimension operators in effective field theory. For example, you would expect that if the coefficient of dimension six operators are suppressed by a TV, the coefficient of dimension eight operators or 10 operators should not be suppressed by the Planck scale. You would roughly expect that they're all suppressed by the same scale. Um, uh, that would lead you to expect that there are interesting nonlinear relations between the couplings. Um, 
Uh, they have to be, that in order to have uh, just by dimensional analysis, have to be, they have to involve products of operators of different dimensions um, in order to compare them with the, uh, each other. But you would expect there are certain nonlinear constraints on the coefficient of higher dimension operators. Now, you might think that's just a consequence of naturalness. And perhaps we could find some UV theory and fine tune in some crazy way in order to make it so the dimension six operators are suppressed by a TEV and the dimension eight operators are, are, are suppressed by, the, by a million TEV. But we're going to see that there are very precise things that you cannot do. Okay, so there are, there are, there are sharp things. There's nothing to do with the naturalness. Um, there are just sharp, precise things that you, that you can't do. Um, uh, and similarly, the, uh, uh, we can compare uh, operators of the same mass dimension with each other. And here, there are just linear relations between them that you'd expect they all have the same mass dimension, but there are linear relations uh, uh, between them. And in fact, these are just two extremes of a general story that mixes these linear and nonlinear constraints between the, uh, uh, between, um, uh, on, 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 on these coefficients. Okay, so um, now, uh, so, so, so that's, that's the claim. Now, uh, just to give you a, a zeroth order idea of where these things uh, uh, come from, um, uh, every time in physics you run to this uh, situation where you have some interesting physical quantity that's represented as a sum of objects with positive coefficients, every time that happens to you, you should think the word polytope. Okay, so that's uh, that's what's going on in all of these in all of these uh, cases. Um, so here's just a, a quick crash course on uh, on, on thinking about the uh, polytopes. So here's the sort of simplest example. If you imagine you have a bunch of vectors v1 to vn, and you want to know what all the points are sort of in the interior here of the sort of convex hull of all of them, then I would write this point a as a weighted sum of all the vertices. Okay, w1 v1 plus w1 vn over the sum of all the w's where very importantly, the weights are all positive. Now, it's actually better to think of this picture uh, projectively, and actually often in physics, this is where, uh, how it's actually given to us. Um, that, uh, that means that I, that I make a one higher dimensional vector out of this by putting a one upstairs. So, so A is now one X, and these vertices, I also put a one upstairs here, and I think of now everything up to overall uh, rescaling. Then if I do that, then all the points A are just of the form W1, V1 plus dot, dot, W, N, V, N, and I don't have to divide by the sum of the w's. That's uh, that's implicit in this uh, in this uh, 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 projectivization. So I, I go from having this the polygon in this example to have a cone in, in in one higher dimension. I have to live somewhere in that cone. And if I slice the cone with any plane, I'll, I'll get the, the picture of this uh, polygon. Okay. So that's often the way of some problem is handed to us. We have some some interesting object that is naturally written as a positive sum. Um, uh, what's what's uh, non-trivial is we now like to sort of characterize all the A's that are of this form. For example, you're getting an A and want to know, is it inside or outside? Um, and for, from that uh, perspective, this definition in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the convex hull is not very useful. Uh, what you want is a dual description of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this polytope which in the case of the polygon is, is very familiar, you want to find what are all the faces of the polytope, and we can cut out the entire polytope by imposing a bunch of uh, inequalities. Okay? So, um, so that's the non-trivial non problem. When you're handed all the vertices, uh, how do you determine all the faces? And because uh, um, uh, it's the face description which uh, concretely tells you how to cut it out uh, with inequalities and lets you check easily whether a point is, in, is inside or not. And, um, and it, it, it's a very simple fact about linear algebra that I don't have time to, uh, to uh, prove here. Um, uh, but again, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the first thing you do if you ever run into this kind of problem, is once you figure out what all the vertices are, the, the facet structure is completely captured by the pattern of, uh, of positivity or zeros of the determinants that you would make by, uh, uh, by, by putting together all these uh, vertex vectors, this VA1 through VAD. Roughly speaking, if VA1, if VA1, VAD is positive, it tells you that A1 is on one side of the plane spanned by the other ones. If it's negative, it tells you it's on the other side. If it's zero, it tells you that they're all 
uh, they all lie on the same plane. And so that pattern of pluses and minuses and zeros completely captures everything that you want to know about the facet structure. And you can actually determine what all the facets are once you know all of these signs. Now, there's a very special class of polytopes in any number of dimensions, which are actually naturally generalize the polygon, um, uh, which are actually have an ordering. So you imagine the vertices have an ordering, and they're ordered in a, in a, in a natural way. And, uh, and the pattern of signs is especially simple, is that all of these, uh, all of these uh, determinants are actually positive, so long as the columns are ordered. When that happens, the matrix is set to be totally positive, or in another language, to live in the positive Grassmannian. Uh, if I look at the convex hull of uh, vertices that look like that, they're a remarkable polytope that's known as the cyclic polytope. And uh, the cyclic polytope, in turn, is the sort of first simplest example of this object uh, that's uh, relevant for Gluon scattering amplitudes and maximally supersymmetric theories, the, the, the uh, k equals one amplitohedron. Um, in general, the amplitohedron is a fancier object with curvy boundaries, but the very, very simplest case is actually polytoplan of the same guy. So, so this is a very canonical and basic and interesting object. And, uh, and the, it's, a, it's a beautiful fact about it that, that, that we actually know the equations that cut out all the faces ahead of time. Okay, so, and it's the following very simple pattern that, uh, that, uh, uh, that says that I take consecutive vertices, VI, VI plus one, VJ, VJ plus one, VK, VK plus one, is the determinants of all of these guys together with A being positive. This is linear in A, and so it gives me the, the equations that cut out uh, uh, all the facets of the cyclic polytope. All right, so, so that's a very general thing that you can do. Um, uh, if you have any problem where you're taking uh, the, the convex solve a bunch of, of, of uh, the convex solve of a bunch of vectors, um, you should figure out what the vectors are. You, you should look at all the, all the signs of all the determinants and that tells you what the facets are. The surprise in our particular problem, see, our particular problem is of the same sort. We, we're going to expand. Uh, we're going to expand this expression in T and in S. Okay, if we expand it in T and S, clearly all these coefficients are going to be written as a certain linear combination with positive coefficients of something. Okay, um, uh, and the surprise is that both in the propagators as well as in the Gegenbauer's, uh, there's a hidden total positivity. There's a structure that has all determinants positive, and therefore ahead of time we know what all of the uh, what all the faces are, and so we know what all the inequalities are that uh, cut cut the sky up. So let me give you uh, uh, just uh, just a, a, a flavor of this. Um, so let's say we, uh, I'm going to do just just to, just to illustrate a, a sort of simple toy example first to illustrate some of these nonlinear constraints. Imagine that we had a function that was just the sum over m squared with some positive weights one over m squared minus s. Okay, and then I just I'm just going to expand that out in powers of s. So I want to know what does it take for these coefficients a0, a1, a2, etc., to be in the convex hull of something that looks like one over m squared, one over m to the fourth, one over m to the sixth, and so on. Well, um, uh, it turns out that that set that curve one x x squared x cubed and so on. It has all minor and positive. It's known as a moment curve. If you take any uh, endpoints on that curve, all the determinants are positive. And therefore, we know what all the equations are that uh, cut out uh, uh, that cut out its facets. And in this case, you can translate it to the following extremely simple statement uh, about uh, about this set of coefficients. So you start with this uh, vector a1 through uh, a1, a2, and so on. You actually build out of it the so-called Henkel matrix. Uh, a, a two by two matrix whose ij uh, entry is a i plus j, and so here it is. Um, and uh, and 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 the the positivity above of both m squared and the probability p of m squared translates to the very simple statement that all the minors of of this Henkel matrix are positive. Okay, so for example. Um, it, the, the easiest case of all, the, 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 that means all the minors, that means every k by k minor that, that, that uh, you can make here has got to be a, a positive. So the easiest case is all the one by one minors that just tell you all these coefficients are positive. That's the very old statement that the coefficient of higher dimension, this leading higher dimension operator has got to be positive. Um, uh, but all the rest of them have got to be positive too. So, so the sort of simplest case you can also sort of trivially see by hand 
what would involve something like A2, A0 minus A1 squared, where you can just very easily see from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality that you have to lie uh, in this region where A2, A0 minus A1 squared is positive. Okay, so so this, is, this is an example of a nonlinear constraint between power dimension operators. Um, uh, uh, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to all, all the k by k minors of this matrix. And this is an if and only of state. Okay? Um, if you happen to know the gap, if, if you happen to know that everything starts from m star, uh, uh, that, that there's nothing in the spectrum up to m star and above, you can actually say a little bit more. Uh, in that case, if we work in units where m star is equal uh, to one, um, I can build not only the Henkel matrix uh, for a0, a1, a2, but also for all the discrete derivatives. So A1 minus A2, A2 minus A3, the double discrete derivatives and so on. And the claim is that all of these vectors have corresponding Henkel matrices uh, that are totally positive. So if I go back to this quadratic example, if I know there's a gap, uh, then, then I cut off this uh, picture with a line uh, here. And uh, uh, in the limit where I don't know where the gap is, so M star could be arbitrarily low, this, this uh, line goes up uh, and you cover, you go back to the uh, initial case again. Of course, if you're a low energy effective field theorist, you don't, you're a low energy observer, you don't know what the gap is. So, so this sort of second statement is a little bit more uh, academic, but it's theoretically interesting that we do know something more about uh, what, what cuts out the space if we know uh, something about the gap. Okay, so this is an example of the nonlinear constraint that I was uh, talking about. Now, what about the linear constraints? Well, um, let's go back uh, to this, uh, um, uh, to this uh, dispersive expression again, I'll, just for simplicity, I'll do an example here where uh, I only keep the expansion in the S channel. Um, <clears throat> then uh, when I expand this out uh, as a function of T, I have, the, well, I have the powers of S, but I also have powers of T that pull down derivatives of this uh, Gegenbauer um, uh, polynomial. And if I now restrict myself to those uh, coefficients that have a fixed mass dimension, then he, from here, you can very easily see that these lie in the convex hull that are given by positive combination of the following interesting vector, um, which is just given by the derivatives of the, of the Gegenbauer polynomial evaluated at, uh, uh, at cosine equals one, evaluated at the forward limit. Okay. All right, so again, as promised, we always get this uh, situation where we get, the, we, we get the sum of a bunch of uh, vectors. In this case, the vectors are labeled by the spin, um, just by the partial wave expansion. The spins are naturally ordered. And the remarkable fact is that if you actually just make this matrix of the, the derivatives of the Gegenbauer polynomial, um, uh, you just stare at it. If you compute any determinant of this uh, matrix, it's positive. All of its minors are positive. So that means that the convex hull of the Gegenbauer, um, of these Gegenbauer vectors is actually a cyclic polytope. And so we know ahead of time all the equations that cut out uh, the space that's allowed by these by these A's. Okay, so this is a, it's a very it's a very cool and unobvious fact. Uh, it's actually equivalent to a result known since the um, uh, 1960s. Uh, that's true for any orthogonal polynomials, which are orthogonal with respect to a positive measure. So in fact, that there there are sort of a three periods uh, in in the history of mathematics where total positivity was discussed. Uh, began with Chebyshev in the mid 1800s, uh, then again in the 1960s um, uh, in the context of this kind of question, and then in the 90s again and the mid mid uh, 2000s. Um, but anyway, uh, this uh, so it, it, it's not obvious, but it's a, it's a beautiful fact that uh, that that there's this connection between the total positivity of uh, of of, of uh, derivatives of orthogonal polynomials with respect to a positive measure. Um, and that's true for any such orthogonal polynomial. But actually, it turns out there's even more hidden positivity to these Gegenbauers than is sort of manifest from what was known in the 60s. And it's useful for the story of the EF dehedron. But, um, but uh, let me not say anything more uh, uh, about it now. So um, uh, this is just meant to illustrate these two things. So, so just from the expansion of the propagator, we get one set of uh, objects where all the minors are positive, and we can, uh, which allows us to. Uh, characterize uh, uh, all of these, uh, everything which comes out of a positive sum of propagators with positive coefficients in terms of matrices with all minors positive, these Hankel matrices. And then the other one is a similar 
story for the expansion of Gegenbauer polynomials that tells me about the uh, key dependence. These are both objects with uh, total positivity properties, um, which are then which then allow us to to predict ahead of time and calculate what what the facet structure of uh, of the corresponding polytopes. And uh, so we did this very systematically in in our in our paper. It's a 120 page paper. I don't want to uh, spend more time talking about it. But I want to stress these things really apply to the real world. So uh, if we're talking about the coefficient of higher dimension operators, for example, for photon or photon graviton scattering, these plots are a little hard, so you can't see them. But just at least impressionistically, uh, you can see that in some two-dimensional uh, parameter space for photon scattering or graviton scattering, you literally lie in these finite, closed, small bounded regions. It's, it's extremely interesting. No matter what's going on in the UV, um, uh, these ratios, uh, um, th this is an example of the Gegenbauer uh, constraints. Um, uh, uh, these ratios uh, have to lie inside these finite uh, bounded, bounded regions. Um, in fact, uh, the Gegenbauer constraints just tell you about unitarity. Um, if you do a dispersal relation in the S channel, sometimes uh, you, you also get information. Uh, you have, uh, you have a, sometimes you can have a, uh, a, a symmetry, for example, if we have a real scalar, we'd have an FPU symmetry, or for particular helicity assignments for photon and graviton scattering, we can have, uh, we can have, uh, uh, we, we can have uh, both symmetry for the, uh, for the external guys as well, which, in, which imposes further constraint on the coefficients of the low energy uh, effective theory, so that on the one hand, they have to lie inside a polytope, on the other hand, they have to lie in a plane that uh, that uh, forces uh, that forces the bow symmetry uh, crossing constraints, and so the intersection of this plane with the polytope that we talk about gives you even smaller regions. So that's what these very tight bounded regions look like. And here are some examples when we have three coefficients. If I go to the next order of the effective field theory, again they can't lie anywhere. They have to lie inside these very particular uh, three-dimensional shapes. And anyway, it goes on uh, from there in general. Um, I just want to quickly say something about the the structure. These objects are simpler cousins of uh, amphitheidra, um, uh, and uh, and uh, and slightly loosely speaking, all these coefficients a, b, q are are given as a particular kind of positive combination of these Gegenbauer vectors. Now, the Gegenbauer vectors have this total positivity property, and the coefficients uh, uh, themselves have a certain nonlinear Hankel positivity uh, uh, condition on them. If we just had a vector is C1, V1 plus T2, V2 plus dot dot, as I told you, uh, that just defines a polytope. Here it's slightly more interesting because the coefficients themselves aren't just random positive numbers, they have to satisfy certain nonlinear positivity constraints. The story of the amphitohedron is very similar. Um, uh, I won't say anything about via context, but uh, just, just to make the, the comparison, we also have some sort of external data. In that case, it sort of specifies the momenta of the gluons of the scattering process. And again, th there is an interesting region that we want to look at, which are, uh, which are associated with the, uh, but where the coefficients, instead of being positive, are associated with the nonlinear sort of Grossmannian uh, positivity. And again, the external data is positive in exactly the same way as the Gegenbauer's were positive. Um, so I think this is sort of amusing that in the past uh, a few years, we've been seeing these interesting nonlinear uh, geometric objects uh, make an appearance in so many different places in, uh, in the physics. Um, some of my mathematician friends um, told me that uh, uh, Gelfand would go around in the 90s to uh, people working on polytopes and say, you polytope people are doing trivial things. You should generalize polytopes into Grassmannians. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so they're really generalizations of these polytopes. The, the eftahedron is a sort of little generalization of polytopes. The amphitohedron is like is the you know two levels deeper than 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 than, than this, and has a lot more things that are going on. But uh, but there are some interesting uh, similarities between them. And certainly, this notion of encountering sort of objects with total positivity in the sense of matrices with all positive, uh, all positive minors is a common theme in um, all of this stuff. All right, so um, uh, I'm, I'm being very, very slow. So, uh, but um, let me just make a, a couple of more uh, comments. So that's just the, that's the, that's the review of the story of the uh, EF dehedron. Um, I wanna make a, 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 a couple of comments before uh, moving on. I guess I'll talk about, um, uh, one of the other two topics uh, uh, quickly. 
Uh, first, I, I, um, I want to mention that that we began this discussion about uh, the coefficient of higher dimension operators by thinking about um, uh, superluminal propagation in some background. And we then switched to talking about um, uh, constraints on amplitudes coming from uh, unitarity and, uh, and causality from the dispersive representation. And uh, something which, uh, which always bothered me from, uh, from a long time ago is that it, looked like the, 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 it looked like the power of those two things was not the same. For example, superluminality only tells you naively that the coefficient of d phi to the four is positive, at least that's what we thought uh, a long time ago. Whereas we seem to get much, much more from the, uh, from the uh, dispersive representation. And uh, I think it's an, it's an interesting question um, whether in fact we can match the constraints more perfectly with each other. Um, and a step in that direction is the following. A step in that direction is to actually realize that, uh, that, that causality tells you more than simply what we thought, certainly what, what, what we thought before. Um, uh, in, order to, in order to see why that is, let's try to sort of match uh, in, in more detail these two pictures that we talked about. Uh, we start with this picture where we turn on a background for a phi where a phi dot is non-zero. And in that background, uh, we see that you can have uh, superluminal uh, uh, propagation for the wrong sign. Uh, the point being that no matter how small the coefficient of the higher dimension operator is, C is, if I make this sort of blob where I turn on phi big enough to size, I can get a macroscopic time delay that I can, a time advance or delay that I can sort of measure at very, very long distances. Okay, so, so one argument is turning on this blob. The other argument is about uh, two to two amplitudes. Okay, so how are these things related? Well, obviously they're related because we think about the propagation through the blob as a sequence of scattering processes of this form. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and this is important for the following reason. Um, uh, Whenever amplitudes are under control, they're small. Uh, um, and so we would like to, uh, so in order to be able to get a constraint, we need to, in the language of amplitudes, we have to go to uh, some situation where despite the fact that the basic sort of, the, the, the fundamental amplitude is small, um, uh, something is arranged so that the amplitude, instead of being one plus i small, it actually exponentiates the e to the i of phase and that phase can become large. If that phase is large, then we can see whether we get a time advance or, or a delay from it. But that means that you have to arrange a scattering situation where despite the fact that the basic amplitude is small, uh, something happens so that you can exponentiate. In this case, what we're doing is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is arranging for that by imagining that we're scattering our hard particle of energy E off a soft background that corresponds to a huge number of particles with small, uh, with, with small momentum. And then if we just add up all these diagrams, of course, I get the enhancement in the propagator from the softness of, of the background. So despite the fact that this basic interaction is small, it does exponentiate. And so this amplitude actually goes like uh, uh, e to the i some phase delta, where if I rewrite it in Lorentz invariant terms, it's e to the i a, a of s over s multiplied by something which is the overall size of the condensate that I, uh, uh, that I turned on. And therefore, in order to have a time delay, we learn that the derivative of this a of s over s at, uh, has to be, a negative a over s over s has to be positive. So that's interesting. That's more than what we strictly thought before, which was just about the coefficient of s squared in the amplitude at low energies. That's the coefficient of the d phi to the four term. This tells us something more. It tells us as a function of s that uh, that negative a of s of, uh, over s has to be uh, has to be monotonic. And it's cool that this that this uh, more fundamental fact about causality actually follows somewhat non slightly non-trivially from the dispersive representation. Okay, so so if, if you take this uh, representation and, and take d by ds a of s over s, you find that it's the integral of something manifestly positive. All right, so at least this is one thing in the direction, one step in the direction of trying to more accurately uh, match uh, what we know from causality considerations and what we know from dispersive uh, uh, considerations. Um, I don't know if they'll, if they'll match perfectly, but it'll be fascinating to think of more clever and interesting backgrounds perhaps that could allow us to access um, things that we don't have access to. Uh, well, uh, that, 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 that can first, for two to two scattering, uh, 
perhaps connect to what we've seen already for, uh, from, from the dispersal consideration. But we also know that there are things that could be true for three to three scattering, four to four, for any point scattering from turning on uh, from uh, 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 positivity constraints on, uh, on these uh, uh, superluminality constraints on these effective theories. So in, in the other direction, um, uh, causality tells us more than just things about two to two scattering that at the moment we don't have good access to from the uh, dispersive part. So that's I think an, an interesting direction to try to figure out how these things map with each other better. Uh, the second point, I think this is a, a, a much a bigger point, a big missing ingredient in these arguments is that um, we use fixed T dispersion relations. Um, and that means that there's a constraint that we're not inputting. Um, uh, and you can actually see a hint that, 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 uh, that there's even more constraints. So, so we get these huge number of uh, constraints on uh, infinite, infinitely many constraints on higher dimension operators. But when you look at what healthy UV theories do, they still don't seem to populate the entire region available from the constraints that we found. They still sort of, uh, they, they still congregate in corners. Uh, and, and it seems that's because we have not yet input, um, we, we've input the constraint of uh, UV of uh, causality, uh, which is again, in the, dis in the dispersive representation, the, the, this Reggie limit where T is fixed and F is arbitrarily big. Um, but we have not input the crucial constraint of uh, uh, sort of traditional UV completion, which is uh, uh, the, the behavior of the amplitude, the softness of the amplitude at um, a high energy fixed angle scatter. Um, <clears throat> so uh, amongst other things, uh, uh, this shows up in the following way. Um, in all sensible UV examples, the contribution to the discontinuity of the amplitude, or if you like, to the partial wave expansion, from higher and higher spins is more and more suppressed as you go to high spin, okay? So um, uh, this is there, this is there in, in, for example, stringy examples where you have towers of higher spin particles, even at tree level. You see it in, in field theory at loop level where in, in the partial wave expansion, you still see higher spins that correspond to the, all the different sort of angular momenta of the particles that could run around the loop, but clearly, uh, their, their contribution as the angular momenta gets bigger and bigger and the particles get further and further apart is more and more suppressed to the, to, to the amplitude. But nowhere in our, that, and that's crucial for the, for the UV uh, healthiness of the, of the theory, but that's not reflected in our, in, our, in our analysis. So it will be fascinating to figure out how to put in this uh, extra information about actually UV completion uh, um, uh, for uh, which will very likely put even more constraints. Okay, now um, I was planning to talk about three things and I've already gone one hour. Um, so uh, uh, perhaps I can ask the uh, uh, organizers, um, can I maybe have another 15 minutes? Uh, I guess, yes. Uh, yes, please. Okay, um, I think uh, maybe what I will do is, um, uh, is uh, skip this part. <laughs> Um, all right, I'll skip this part. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to uh, talk about it in the, in the discussion. Um, but, but let me quickly switch to this, uh, 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 to this other topic of uh, uh, celestial amplitudes and, um, and, uh, and what you can think of as an anti-Wilsonian uh, paradigm. Okay. Um, All right, so <clears throat> let me just jump into uh, uh, thinking about the celestial sphere. Um, and one, one natural motivation is just thinking about null momenta in, uh, um, in Minkowski space. So um, uh, if you have a null momentum, uh, the associated two by two matrix, uh, when you dot into the uh, sigma matrices has vanishing determinant. And so we can write the P alpha alpha dot as the product of lambda alpha and lambda tilde alpha dot, where lambda alpha and lambda tilde alpha dot are two vectors. These are the famous spinner helicity variables. Okay, and the spinner helicity variables very naturally uh, give you something uh, that is parametrized by a coordinate on the, on the celestial sphere. After all, of course, a null, a null ray points in some direction of the celestial sphere that, that, that surrounds you. And, uh, and this representation of the null momentum makes that very manifest. So if I take 
these are two vectors. Um, if I take out an overall scale out of both of them, uh, which I'll call root two omega, then I can write one of them as one z and the other one is one z tilde. And z and z tilde are just uh, complex coordinates, uh, z and z bar, sorry, z and z bar are really complex coordinates on the Riemann celestial sphere, okay? And so therefore, when, when just labeling the uh, null momenta in terms of this frequency omega, that's the energy of the ray and the direction of the ray uh, naturally uh, gives you variables that label the celestial sphere. Okay, now uh, Lorentz transformations act on lambda and lambda tilde by SL2C, just two by two complex transformations. And so from here, we can see that the Z prime uh, under uh, a Lorentz transformation is just a Mobius transformation of Z. So that's, uh, that's, just, the, uh, that's just the usual SL2 uh, uh, Mobius or conformal transformations on Z. And omega changes uh, in this way. Um, and, and, uh, and I also pick up a phase that I can think of as the action of the little group. Okay, so, so anytime, and you know, people who work with massless amplitudes are using these variables all the time. And so they're automatically uh, can be thought of if you write the lambdas um, and lambda tildes in this way as variables associated with points on the celestial sphere and energy. Okay, so, so far there is nothing new, but uh, the interesting new thing is, is to consider the scattering not of momentum eigenstates, but of boost eigenstates. And so, uh, so a boost eigenstate is going to be an integral over all energies, omega raised to some weight delta of omega and z. And then you can see that under Lorentz transformation, a general Lorentz transformation, this guy goes into the Mobius transform z and it picks up some overall weight. And in particular, if you do a Lorentz transformation in the direction of z, it just picks up, uh, it's, 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 it's an eigenvector, it picks up, uh, Stays the same, and it just picks up some uh, overall weight. Okay, so these are these states are eigenstates of boost in the z direction, and uh, and if I scatter these things instead of momentum eigenstates, the objects that I get transform under SL two exactly like uh, correlation functions of a primary field and a conformal field theory. Okay, but that's the but uh, at the moment I'm not talking about any conformal field theory or anything like that. That the relation to conformal invariance is just trivially to the Lorentz group is SL two, which is also the a conformal group uh, on the sphere. Okay, so the physical point is that we're scattering boost eigenstates instead of momentum eigenstates. Okay? And so um, how do we go from uh, boost eigenstates to a uh, 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 momentum eigenstates to boost eigenstates? Well, we just take the ordinary uh, amplitudes, um, um, momentum space amplitudes uh, as a function of uh, omega and z. And I simply integrate them with the weight d omega over omega, omega to the delta. So this is a Mellon transform, okay? So I go from something that is a, a function of an energy in the direction z and, uh, and z to things that are a function of a weight uh, and z, okay? All right, this is especially simple at four points. Um, if you have four point scattering, the SL2 uh, invariance tells you that, that the amplitude, which is just Lorentz, again, I remind you, it tells you that the amplitude can only depend on this cross ratio of the four points, Z, which is Z1 minus Z3, Z2 minus Z4 over this other combination. Uh, and um, another nice fact is that we know that the amplitude, uh, uh, we know that by momentum conservation, two in, two out, the amplitude lives on a plane just lives on a, on a two-dimensional plane, that two-dimensional plane intersects the celestial sphere on a great circle. And so we learn there's something interesting about this thing uh, that, uh, that, that this uh, Mellon amplitude has to vanish unless the four points lie on a common circle. Okay? The constraint that four points lie in a common circle is simply that the cross ratio is real. So that means that, uh, that uh, by momentum conservation, there's an overall delta of Z minus Z bar um, uh, in front of the whole thing. And after we factor that out, uh, we have this extremely simple um, uh, expression that says that the amplitude in, uh, sorry, this is the amplitude in, in Mellon space that, that, that should have been a function of uh, uh, deltas here, is something that depends on the hoarding of these external particles. This, this delta of Z minus Z bar that just tells you the four points are uh, coplanar with each other. And what's left is nothing other than just a Mellon transform of the ordinary uh, amplitude as a function of the center of mass energy omega, um, weighted by this parameter beta, 
which is just the sum of all the weights of the external particles. So after all of this uh, song and dance, uh, when we scatter boost eigenstates for two to two scattering, all we're doing is taking a Mellon transform of the conventional two to two amplitude at fixed angle, at fixed angle, but a Mellon transform with respect to the energy. Okay. All right, now, the, the study of uh, uh, celestial amplitudes um, over the past uh, five, six, seven years, especially from uh, uh, Andy Strominger and his friends, uh, has already clarified, unified, and revealed many aspects of um, infrared physics, IR physics, soft amplitudes, fascinating connections between Weinberg soft theorems and memory effects and, uh, and, uh, and uh, symmetries on the enhanced symmetries on the celestial sphere. Okay, so there's a lot which has been done and, and continuing to do, and we even talked about some more of them in our paper on uh, infrared aspects of the story. But what I want to focus on here is ultraviolet aspects, because I think this is actually something uh, really novel and uh, interesting, because boost eigenstate scattering is a perfect probe of the UVIR connection. Um, uh, when you scatter boost eigenstate, it maximally violates Wilsonian intuition, because we're scattering states with arbitrarily high energies. And as we'll see, effective field theory amplitudes don't even make sense in this context. You can't even talk about uh, scattering boost eigenstates without having UV complete things uh, from the get-go. Uh, some people might think uh, this is bad, and if you're a conventional effective field theorist, you think this is bad. But if, uh, but you know, if we're trying to understand how to more precisely think about the way in which the Wilsonian picture of the world is wrong, especially when we have gravity. It's good to be forced into a situation where you don't have that as a crutch to uh, rely on. Okay? So let me just give you a, an example. So I think that the, so that this is a good thing. This is not not a bad thing. Uh, but let me give you a simple example. Let's say you have a two to two amplitude like gravity that goes like energy squared, omega squared. Okay. Well, you'll just see what the problem is. How do I Mellon transform this? If it goes like some power p, uh, how do I Mellon transform integral d omega over omega omega to the uh, uh, omega to the beta plus p? Okay, so uh, this doesn't make sense. It's ill-defined for any p bigger than zero. I, I don't. I don't even know how to uh, how to make sense of this uh, uh, integral. Okay. All right. So um, so let's then begin with by looking at something which is sort of healthier in the UV and just to start getting some uh, uh, intuition. Um, and what we're going to do here uh, in in the entire rest of this uh, discussion, I'm going to be focusing on the behavior of the Mellon amplitude as a function of beta. That's because beta is like the total boost weight. Okay, so uh, beta is the sum of all the deltas for the particle. Beta is a total boost weight. And so, uh, of course, there's a lot of interesting things in the d dependence as well, the, the normal angular dependence of the amplitudes, but, but, the, but all the, at least the zeroth order novelties of scattering boost eigenstates are, are seen in the dependence on beta. So in the rest of, uh, in, uh, in, in, Rest of this discussion, I'm just going to tell you various interesting facts about the 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 about the uh, uh, about how the amplitude in in on um, how the celestial amplitude depends on beta, okay? and uh, develop some intuition for it and some dictionary with things that we uh, understand uh, uh, better and and also connect to to uh, effective field theory. Okay, so let's do our first example um, where we imagine that we're integrating out something at tree level, like a phi cube theory. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, imagine we had a phi cube theory, we integrate at a tree level, at low energies we'd have some effective phi four coupling. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so here I'm, I'm integrating out something of mass M, uh, but in the full theory, this is what the amplitude would uh, look like. Okay, so in terms of the cubic couplings, this lambda is D squared over, over M squared. All right, so that's the, that's the tree level amplitude uh, in momentum space. What is the Mellon transform of this? Okay, in this case, it's easy enough to do this transform. And this is the ex expression we get. First, if we just want to do it analytically, it has this interesting structure. We get this, uh, uh, the, the, the dependence on the mass is just m to the beta. And it has an infinite sequence of poles. Okay, it has, an, uh, it has this one minus e to the i pi beta. That means it has, uh, it has infinitely many poles, both on the negative axis and on the positive axis. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more where these come from uh, to begin with, but uh, it, it, I'll say a little more generally where they arise, but we can already see it in this example. What are all these poles at negative beta? Okay, All these poles at negative beta, well, where do the poles come from in this expression? Where, when, 
the only possible pull will come from uh, when the integral is going close to omega goes to zero or omega goes to infinity. If we look at the part where omega goes to zero, I have d omega over omega, omega to the beta, and around omega, omega equals zero, let's say that, that the amplitude uh, had a power series expansion in omega. Then I'd have an integral of uh, omega to the beta plus n, that would give me a pole that looks like one over beta plus uh, the, the omega to the two n, it's, it's powers of omega squared. So I get poles in beta plus two n from the infrared part of, uh, of the expansion of uh, m. Okay, so there are poles at negative beta that are reflecting uh, the expansion of the amplitude uh, 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 in the low energy effective theory. Okay, and the coefficients, the residues of these poles are literally the coefficients of the higher dimension uh, are, are, the, are the coefficients in, the, in, in, in that expansion. If you like, the coefficients of the higher dimension operators are literally the residues of these poles. What about on the other side? Well, on the other side, this is just a garden variety field theoretic amplitude, and it also has a power law fall off with energy at large energies. So we just have the inverse of the phenomenon that we just talked about. The residues of the pole here on the positive beta axis are just telling you about the about the various uh, uh, power law falloffs with energy of the amplitude in the ultraviolet. Okay, now already this example shows you the anti-Wilsonian nature of what's going on when we scatter a boost eigenstate uh, instead of momentum eigenstates. If I have the ordinary uh, momentum amplitudes, if I just take this expression and stupidly take the mass to infinity, I just go to the low energy expression smoothly. So the low energy expression for a phi four coupling would just give me lambda, be minus lambda here. Um, uh, so, okay, so uh, that's it. Um, but that's just not true when I scatter the boost eigenstate. See, the entire dependence on the mass is in this factor m to the beta. So nothing, nothing smooth happens as the mass goes to infinity. Um, and so there's no sense in which this expression sort of turns into the expression that I would get from Mellon transforming the 5-4 amplitude of the low energy theory. See, for the 5-4 amplitude, in this case, I would get the integral of d omega over omega, omega to the beta. And, uh, and there, you can interpret that as delta of beta. If you just uh, uh, switch to an exponential representation for omega, you can interpret that as delta of beta. Okay, so there's some kind of uh, roughly reasonable formula for the Mellon transform of the 5-4 uh, of the of the low energy uh, of, of the effective field theory by four amplitude, but that object is not analytic in beta. It's just this terrible delta of beta, and it does not smoothly connect to what we get in the full theory. Okay, the full expression is perfectly analytic. There's only all on the axis, but it's perfectly analytic, and there's no sensible. There, I mean, there's a formal sense in which one expression can be interpreted as the other as m goes to infinity, but but they're, they're totally different from each other. One of them is infinitely many poles as the analytic, the effective field theory one is not. Okay? So, so that just illustrates uh, what, what, what's happening. Why is this happening? Because we're scattering good like states that have arbitrarily high energies in them. All right, so just saying again, what I said a, uh, a moment ago about where these poles come from, um, we get both IR poles and U, uh, we get poles when the uh, low energy amplitude has an expansion in powers of omega to the 2n, now coming here from at low energies. And we can also get poles if the high energy amplitude has a power law fall off, as we expect in, in field theory, that gives us these poles 1 over beta minus 2n. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, that's the sort of zero order picture, is that in the m plane, we expect to have poles the negative beta poles reflect the effective field theory expansion. The positive beta poles are there, uh, 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 reflecting power law fall off of amplitudes in uh, quantum field theory. And that uh, actually already uh, indicates a radical difference between quantum gravity and field theory. So if we have uh, if we have the Mellon transform of amplitudes in quantum gravity, um, uh, they have a qualitative difference from what we just saw in field theory. Uh, and that's because we know something about two to two scattering of high energy, uh, uh, about high energy two to two scattering in gravity. I'll, 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 I'll review a little aspect of it in a second. But again, we have this picture that at very high energies, two to two scattering uh, basically produces large black holes. Sorry, uh, uh, the scattering in high energy produces large black holes. And therefore, the amplitude for two to two scattering, exclusive two to two scattering, should be exponentially small. It should be given by roughly e to the negative the entropy of the black hole. Of, uh, of energy omega, then in four dimensions would go like e to the minus g newton omega squared. 
So the high energy amplitude is exponentially soft in, um, uh, in, in any theory of uh, quantum gravity, ultimately because you make black holes. Now, if you have a weak coupling or a scale beneath the Planck scale, like the string scale, then that exponential softness kicks in earlier. Uh, we know that strings already make the amplitude exponentially soft, but ultimately gravity makes it as, uh, as, as even softer. Okay? So regardless of whether or not we have strings in the intermediate uh, energy range, asymptotically at high enough energies, um, uh, the amplitudes are exponentially soft. And that means there are no contributions uh, there are no poles from the omega goes to infinity limit. Okay, remember all that's going on is I'm doing these Mellon transforms. So I can get a pole uh, from, uh, from the omega goes to infinity part if there's a power law fall off with omega. If clearly, if I make the, the exponent beta big enough, I should have a divergence. But if the high energy behavior is exponentially soft, I don't care. I can make beta as big as I like, and, uh, and there are no singularities. So that's an extremely interesting qualitative difference between, uh, again, uh, reflecting this anti-Wolfsonian business that if you have uh, the if you have the celestial amplitude for a field theory and for quantum gravity, there's a fingerprint of it being gravitational, which is the total absence of any of these poles on the positive uh, beta axis. Okay. Now, actually, we can go further than this. Um, we know that in the low energy effective field theory. Um, at tree level, we have an expansion in powers of omega squared, but at loop level, we get logs. We know at loop level, the massless loops generate logs. And so the real expansion is in powers of omega. And let's say I have gravity. I'm just illustrating the case of gravity. Powers of omega, powers of G Newton omega squared, because uh, uh, that's the, the effective uh, dimensionless coupling for gravity, and some powers of, uh, of, of UV logs, OK? Um, Okay, so this is the, this is the uh, expression that we have. So we, we not only have these powers in omega, we're modulated uh, with the logs. And, uh, and uh, that's very simple because the, the contribution uh, to the Mellon transform at low energies from powers of omega modulated by logs, see the logs I can just get by taking derivatives with respect to, the, to, to A. And so what I get, uh, what I get from here are um, not just simple poles in beta, which is what I had before, but uh, from if I have R logarithms, I get not just simple poles, but double poles, triple poles, higher poles, R poles in the beta. All right, so, so here's the summary then. Uh, if we're talking about some, uh, a gravitational theory, there are no poles at all for positive beta. For negative beta, uh, I have poles at uh, negative integer uh, values of beta. The, the residues of the simple poles are the coefficients of the higher dimension operators, and the residues of the double and higher poles are the logarithmic running of the, of the effective field theory coefficients. So I find this quite beautiful because um, uh, in, on the celestial sphere, uh, the effective field theory coefficients and their running uh, turn into something very canonical. You know, we of course care about them in momentum space because we're stuck at low energies, and we're trying to measure these uh, coefficients. But they have a more invariant meaning on the celestial sphere as residues of poles um, as a function of the boost weight. And these are, of course, exactly the objects that we just talked about uh, satisfying all these infinitely many positivity conditions. So at the very least, we're learning some consistency conditions on amplitudes and uh, on the celestial amplitudes. Somehow, we've got to produce these interesting functions with residues only on negative beta, if we're talking about gravity, not at positive beta, and the coefficients have to satisfy all these interesting positivity constraints. All right, so, so much for the analytic behavior in the beta plane. I'll just say something quick uh, and then end about the uh, behavior at large beta. So first, as beta goes to plus infinity, uh, 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 this Mellon integral is dominated by large energy. And again, we know what the, we know roughly what the amplitude looks like at large energy. Uh, it goes like e to the minus g newton omega squared. That's just this. Uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, the the black hole production picture. So so the two to two amplitude dies exponentially with energy as we go to high energy. But uh, that tells us that in Mellon space, uh, the amplitude mod squared grows exponentially. In fact, it grows like gamma beta as you go to uh, high energy. So that's, uh, that's one 
uh, interesting qualitative thing is that the, the physics of black hole production is a certain exponential growth at large positive beta. There's, uh, there's a, a more, a more uh, I think, a, a very interesting but uh, detailed point, um, which is that uh, while we say that the two to two amplitude dies exponentially at, uh, at high energy in gravity, um, it's not smooth. Uh, here's a simple model for what the uh, for what the uh, two to two uh, what, for for what the amplitudes involving black holes looks like. Imagine that we have some basic interaction between, let's say, the in states and the out states and uh, and the jth black hole microstate. Okay, so we have some basic interaction here. Now, uh, the claim is that there are order e to the s uh, black hole microstates, and the claim is that each one of these amplitudes is of order e to the minus s. Uh, e to the minus the entropy of the black hole over two, but maybe modulated with some, some phase. Now, this picture explains why the total production cross-section for the black hole is one, because I just mod squared, uh, I mod squared this basic uh, three point and sum over all the black hole states, and I get the e to the minus s from here, and I multiply by an e to the plus s of the number of black hole states to get something of order one. But the in to out amplitude is a sum uh, uh, over e to the minus s black hole from the, from from this product. If I just glue these two things, uh, if I glue the in the out together, but now I get uh, when in and out are not the same, I get the sum over e to the s black hole random phases, and there's the usual root n cancellation here. So when I take the mod squared for the in to out amplitude for the exclusive amplitude, then I do get something from this argument that goes like e to the minus s black hole, but it's very chaotic. So there's some envelope that's dying like e to the minus s black hole, but since it's coming from uh, from averaging all these e to the plus s black hole random phases, it's varying very wildly and chaotically. However, that's not what we expect for the amplitude of Mellon space, because exam because it's doing uh, uh, an integral over, uh, because it's a boost eigenstate, it's averaging over all the energies. And so we expect, and you can see this very, you can see this in simple toy examples, that the Mellon amplitude is growing exponentially and is smooth. So all the physics of black hole microstates and all that stuff is somehow encoded in energy space in the two to two amplitude that dies exponentially with chaotic wild fluctuations, but is instead seen on the celestial sphere as a certain smooth exponential growth uh, at large beta. That's a qualitative difference that I think is very interesting and worth uh, uh, thinking about more. Finally, um, let me tell you what the large beta behavior looks like as beta goes to minus infinity. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and here uh, we, we can also see it from our simple uh, toy example. Uh, as beta goes to minus infinity, uh, this amplitude just uh, it, it goes like m to the minus beta and it has all of these, it goes like m to the beta and has this infinite series of poles. Um, and you can actually argue that on uh, general grounds that the, that the large beta behavior actually goes like there's always infinitely many poles and it goes like m star to the beta where m star is the gap to the first massive states. So at tree level, if we had only poles, it'd be where the first pole is. Uh, if we had a branch cut in S, it would be where the branch cut begins. And even there's a modulation of the power of beta that reflects the threshold behavior near where you start seeing the uh, first states. Okay, so, so, uh, so this is, this is, uh, Interesting, we have this function, it only has poles. Um, if it's uh, quantum gravitation, it only has poles on the negative beta axis. The residues on the poles are effective field theory coefficients. And we know something about the behavior at infinity. We know what it's supposed to do with plus infinity is uh, at least roughly, it has to have this exponential, smooth exponential growth associated with black hole physics. And at minus infinity, <clears throat> uh, the leading behavior is has to do with the gap to the lightest states. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, so uh, all we've done here is sort of translate uh, familiar facts from uh, momentum space to statements about the structure of the um, uh, of uh, the scattering of boost eigenstates. Uh, the hope for this program uh, is that perhaps there's the, the 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 question of determining the amplitude as a function of beta. Uh, perhaps this question might be easier, or at least uh, differently posed. Um, on the celestial sphere than it is for the usual uh, amplitude in uh, momentum space. So just uh, summarizing what we've seen so far, we have this uh, interesting function only with poles and beta, no more complicated analytic structure. The poles and beta reflect the effective field theory couplings. They're constrained by all the EF dehedron positivity constraints. 
Uh, beta goes to plus infinity is prescribed by black hole physics. The leading behavior, beta minus of infinity, is controlled by the gap. So super naively, you think, well, we know a lot about this function. We know about its pole and its leading behavior at infinity. Um, what else is needed in order to uh, determine it? Could it be that, that this information is actually enough to, uh, uh, to determine what f of beta is? And it appears that something more is needed. Um, for example, just, just to give you a, a, a dumb example, um, uh, let's say I take A of beta and I shift it by some constant mu to the beta, where this mu is bigger than the gap to the lightest space M star. Then uh, this is it essentially changes nothing in the analytic structure. It cha doesn't change the poles and it's subdominant to the known behavior of both the beta goes to plus infinity and beta goes to minus infinity. But if I translate this back to frequency space, it's horribly non-analytic in as a function of omega or as a function of s. I get something that's shifted by delta of s minus mu squared. Now, so basic analyticity in frequency or in energy, which has to do with causality, um, uh, we need to figure out some way of, uh, of translating uh, basic analyticity and energy to statements about uh, uh, to statements about the celestial amplitudes uh, in order to go for. Um, okay, so uh, uh, that's it. I had a third subject that I wanted to talk about, but I've already gone uh, over far too long. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that and see if there are any questions. Thank you.